Hey, you guys ready to get rolling? Yes. <laughs> Woo! Welcome to Online Privacy 101. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk primarily about three different things. We're going to talk about Facebook, your phone, and Google. Um, there's going to be a lot of information here. So don't feel overwhelmed. Just take whatever's relevant for you and feel free to ignore the things that are not relevant for you. Uh, and of course, feel free to ask me anything. If there's anything in particular you'd like to learn about today, we're going to have points throughout the presentation where we can stop and ask questions. Um, so not to worry, just, just keep in mind your questions and I'm sure, I promise we will, we will get to them. So are you being tracked? Uh, like I said, we're going to primarily be looking at three things, your phone, Google, and Facebook. Uh, we will not be covering search engines, Alexa, and other privacy settings from across the web because there is so much when we talk about privacy and the web. We're just going to talk about the three. I'm going to be picking on Google and picking on Facebook a little bit here. Um, and some tracking can be good, but some tracking can also be bad. And when we talk about tracking, we're tracking, we're talking about both location tracking, so physically your location, as well as data tracking from across the web. And of course, really what this boils down to is privacy and trust. There's a trust threshold we talk about when we give companies our information. Um, you're creating a relationship with these apps that you allow to use your location and information, but there is a trade-off because you do get services as well. Um, and one thing that I like to keep in mind when we talk about privacy is none of us are that special. Um, you know, it's not like Mark Zuckerberg is personally <laughs> hacking into our webcams and nefarious and looking at our data. Um, that said, keeping some of your information secure is still important. Um, and of course, it's an app by app decision. You know, we're, when we talk about that trust threshold, it's each app you're going to have a different level of trust with. Uh, there's a difference between maps and, and 911 services and health insurance. So you can look up which hospital you can go to that your insurance takes, and Target and craft stores and nanny cam apps. Location services can have both good and bad elements. Um, you can share your location with family and friends so they can find you. You can uh, it makes it easier to download some apps like Freegal and Hoopla so you know they can figure out which library is closest to you or where services are located. Um, it can map traffic when you're stuck at 3 p.m. on Sanibel and you need to get overseas. Uh, and of course, there's, there's a really good element of IP and security. So if your computer knows primarily you spend your time on Sanibel and all of a sudden you sign in in India, it's going to go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not right. But also, there are some bad elements that we got to talk about. Um, advertisers know where you've been and for how long you've been there. Um, there's the potential for becoming a victim of criminal activity with the more information that's out there, the more potential there becomes. And your battery and phone performance will decline over time the more you use location services. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, all right. When you say advertisers know where you've been for how long, you mean physically yes in which location yeah yeah i'm glad you're not, not tracking across sites well that too and that too yeah okay. both of them but physically i'm glad you brought that up uh this is an example that i use so google will store a timeline of where you've been and for how long you've been there so this is an example back when i allowed them to track uh my location it tracked me at this this car dealership in seattle um and it said you know i spent 45 minutes there uh, and then it shows you all the places you've been recently and, and where you're going and why, you've, how long you've been there. And what are the potential consequences for a company like Google having this information? Well, you know, the next day, all of a sudden, I see advertisements start to pop up for the other car dealership across town or all of the stores and services that are located in this area because it's like, oh, you've been there. So, oh, I can, I know, I know what I'll do. I'll tell you about a store that's right over here. So while you're waiting for your car, you can go and go into the store, go into this restaurant. So there is a lot of potential for, for information like this to build and build and build. Yeah. How did you find this information? Is this because you were signed in with a Google account? That's right, yeah. And we're gonna talk about how to turn all that stuff off and pause it and, and get into that. So for example, one thing kind of leads into another. So I allow Google to track my location for one week. And based on that, I let it see exactly which website, websites I was visiting, which places I was going to, how long I was spending in places. I basically turned all my privacy settings completely off just to see what the algorithm would do. And what it did is sorted me into all these different categories. Now it didn't get quite everything right. It got right that I'm between 25 and 35. 
my language is English. It knew that my, I have at least a bachelor's degree. It knows that I am not a parent. I'm not in a relationship. Um, and I'm interested in home improvement, but you know, it knows I'm female, but there's other things that it doesn't quite get right. But this is only a week's worth of tracking, you know, a week's worth of, of looking at the data and like not me telling it, oh, I'm 25 years old or whatever, but it just extrapolating that based on the searches and based on the places I go to across the web. So you didn't enter any of those things into your profile? Nope, nope, nope. The algorithm did it for me. Really like this quote from the Washington Post, Google products are privy to some deeply personal information about your life. For example, Google searches can leave clues about your illness, while its maps tool can collect your comings and goings. While knowing that info helps it make personalized products, it also helps the company target ads. So this is not a new problem. This was published in September of last year, but we've been talking about Google and tracking and privacy for decades now. Uh, it just keeps getting smarter and smarter. So how can we stop Google from tracking you? Um, this is an opportunity where you might want to write down this pathway. If you have a Google account, you can go to myaccount.google.com and then data and privacy and then web and app activity. Um, and then turn off the toggle for web and app activity. So you're basically asking it to pause the data collection. Yeah. How long can you pause it for? Indefinitely. Okay. Yeah. And well, that's Google if you have a Google account. Yes. Are there other, is there other software that's doing the same thing that uh, we should be considering? Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm picking on Google right now. So Google's, because Google is the one primary people primarily use and the account that people primarily have with. So, you know, your different accounts could have different privacy settings as well, but I'm being mean to Google today. Look at them. Yeah. Look at the privacy settings. Exactly, exactly. So practically, what does that look like? Well, on your Google account, web and app activity, uh, one thing that I point out here specifically with a giant arrow is to not include audio recordings, because this is the default setting where Google will keep your audio recordings and keep your voice print, because your voice print is almost as unique as your fingerprint. You know, you can use it to unlock things. And Google will try to get one up on you and be sneaky and keep that voice recording. And we don't want that. So I always make sure at the minimum, voice recordings is not selected. You can also pause your web and app activity and your location history. You can't like stop it and say never track me, but you can pause it. And that's the closest you can come to saying stop. I don't want to, I don't want you to track me anymore. Um, I keep my YouTube history on because it's easier to find videos and things like that. But uh, in terms of web and app activity, I don't really think that Google needs to know where I'm going across the web and for how long I'm going to spend there. Another question. Mm -hmm. Could you remind us? What other things Google owns? Alphabet is the company. So if you basically there's five media companies that control the world. <laughs> Meta, which is Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, um, Apple. Twitter, Apple. So um, so because YouTube is part of Alphabet. Isn't yes, it? that's correct. Yeah. Something else. There's thousands and thousands of things that are part of Google. I mean, same thing with Facebook, right? Facebook just keeps eating and eating and eating and taking parts of the pie. Alternatives, DuckDuckGo is great. I know we talked about that a little bit before we started here, but um, DuckDuckGo, DuckDuckGo is a great way to stop your information from being tracked across the web. It's not a guarantee that your privacy and private information is gonna be protected, but it is an extra little step. And that's the one thing that I'd really like to take away here is like, it's very easy to take a defeatist attitude when we look at the on when we look at the internet and we look at privacy. It's easy to say, well, you know, the horse is already out of the barn. What's the point in closing the door? Or it's easy to say, my information is already out there in so many different ways. Why should I bother changing the settings on a few different things? But it's almost toxic to take that kind of attitude when we come to these things because you have to do what you can to protect your information. You know, it's it's important to do what you can and to feel like you're in control of your information a little bit. Is this the Canadian club today? Oh, yeah, bud. <laughs> oh, that's okay. We don't need them. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions about Google before we move on to Facebook? 
Okay. Um, Facebook's guilty of the exact same thing as Google is. They're collecting all your clicks, your likes, your comments, your groups, your pages, and your interactions to sort you into these categories. This is actually a screenshot I pulled off the internet. This was not my personal categories um, because it used to be that you could access these categories. Hi, come on in. Uh, it used to be you could access these different categories and see where you were, where you ended up. Um, but they, they've taken away that option and it's, they don't allow you to do that anymore. Really? Yeah. You just can't dig in anywhere. Find it. There you go. So it used to be you could you could pull up this up and see where it sorted you into these things, but now it's kind of like oh we've put you into these categories, but we're not going to tell you what they are. Pop quiz: Is Facebook selling your personal information to advertisers? Yeah. You bet they are. Data tracking. Um, if you're going to change one setting on your Facebook, I would recommend you change this one. Um, Facebook is tracking you across the web. They're, they're seeing what you're doing on other sites that are not Facebook related, uh, even after you leave Facebook. And, and they're, they'll say it in, in very clever language that makes it seem like they want to improve your user experience. They want to make everything better for you. But when really, in reality, what they're asking for is to track everything you're doing even after you leave Facebook in order to create better advertisements for you on Facebook. And it's really important to make sure you're sharing exactly what you want to share. Um, your phone number, your email, and your date of birth will be default public information unless you deliberately go make it private. So under privacy checkup, which we'll talk about how to do, um, you can go and make sure that these different things, like phone number, set to only me. So the only person who can access that is you. Same thing with birthday and friends. Um, I allow friends to see the birthday so they can find you a little more easily and say, you know, oh, what's what's so-and-so's birthday? I'll, I'll look that up on their Facebook, right? So that way, because nobody, let's be honest with each other here, nobody remembers everyone's birthday. So that's nice to have a cheat sometimes. Um, but birth year, well, I mean, it depends, right? Like we talked about that privacy, that, that trust threshold. So which, which information do you want to trust with the public? Which information do you want to be out there? And you're getting this information from profile information? Yeah, from, yeah. So that's settings? that's a really good question. Um, so what we do is we go to facebook.com and then you click on that little down arrow down there or on an app, it might look different. And then you go to privacy checkup. Okay, on Facebook? Yes. Only? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're picking on, you missed a little bit of the beginning, that's but I said, okay. we're just going to be picking on Google and Facebook and your phone today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I'm happy to answer any questions you have about other right. services. I just want to get in the right way. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I would recommend running a privacy checkup on all these different categories if you have a Facebook account. So Facebook credit where credits do, they do do a fairly good job of allowing you to make changes at the microscopic level, allowing you to see who accesses your data and why. Um, the big concern I have with Facebook is just the amount of data they're sharing with advertisers. Any questions about Facebook before we move on to talking about phones? Is there any way in Facebook, if I use a fictitious name, mm -hmm. um, that people can go in there and somehow they find my name? Not unless you share it. Okay. Like, here's the thing, right? Like, if you create a fake account named Joe Schmo, but you use alancase at gmail.com, <laughs> it's going to know, right? Uh, so phones, in some ways your phone is better for privacy and in some ways it's worse. Um, we're talking about both physical location tracking and location tracking across the web. Um, I think your phone is better at making changes on the physical location so you can change who's accessing your location and why. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Siri, aka Apple versus independent apps, because um, there is a big difference there. If you have a phone, if you have a cell phone, it's already in your name. There's a little bit of your information that's already going to be shared with Apple. You can't avoid it. That's the price we pay for carrying around these smart computers in our pockets. Um, but it's completely personal. It's a completely personal choice about which information, additionally from that, that you want to share. 
Um, here are some Apple settings that I've changed on my own personal device. Um, under analytics and improvements, they say, oh, share with app developers, help us, help us make apps better for you and improve Siri, help, help the community make Siri better. But what they're really asking here is let us keep statistics on which apps you use and why. Let us keep your voice recordings and listen to what you say and let us access all your contacts, locations and track everything you do. That's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> uh, unnecessary, you know. I, and, I agree. And they get away with it. Yeah. If you let them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And they'll, they'll phrase it as this way of like, hey, buddy, hey, pal, yeah. let's get together and help the community. Let's, yeah. let's help everyone make the app better. But in reality, they're smart. They're smart to it. Uh, does anyone know what a third party application is? Yeah. It was developed by someone, not Apple. That's right. Yeah. And they allow them to put it on their site. Yes. For you to download. That's right. So a third party application is something that does not come already preset on your phone. Your phone is already, when you turn it on for the first time, there's going to be some apps installed. Those are in-house apps. Third party app is anything that we go to the app store and we download. Okay. Do we want to allow third party applications to track, track you? Um, you know, I turned the setting off personally, but again, like we talked about, there's a trade-off. So me turning the setting off on my devices doesn't necessarily mean that uh, I'm going to have consequences from it, but it doesn't mean that I'm not either. <laughs> but what about other settings? Um, if we go to settings on our phone and then privacy, there's a lot of changes you can make, like who you're allowing to use your camera, your Bluetooth, your photos. So under settings, under privacy, we're going to talk about location services too. But if you click on each one of these individually, you're going to see, oh, these are the apps that have requested to use that information. Who do we want to access our location and under what conditions? Um, and again, credit where credit's due with Apple, you really can make changes on the microscopic level. You can really control and put a tight control on where you're sharing your location and why you're sharing your location. So with Apple, you can change it to while using, which is only when you have the app open. You can change it to never. You can change it to only when shared and you can change it to always um, and how you decide which one is right for you is your own personal decision. So this is just a screenshot from my personal phone and um, I've made changes to all of these different applications based on what's right for me. So with an airline um, when shared. So when the app asks to use my location, because sometimes that comes in handy when you're using in flight services or you're trying to find flights or whatever it may be, that can come in handy. Um, I don't think Amazon needs to use my location, but sometimes that could come in handy too. Um, workouts while using, so it can track where I'm going, track where I'm running. Um, camera while using, so it can keep a track of all my different photos, where I took the photos, which can kind of be a neat feature to create albums. Can I ask you a question about yes. that? Yes. Uh, because I think they also have the question of when you're sending a photo to somebody or sharing, do you want to include all the data that comes with the photo? Yeah, yeah. Because every photo, every time you take a photo, you're taking the photograph, but you're also having this portfolio of what we call metadata. Yeah. So where you took the photo, what device you took the photo on, which time you took the photo, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all that information seems like just little tiny bits, but it can add up to really point toward the bigger picture of your information. Because I turn that seems to me I've turned that off about sharing the, the details. Yeah, yeah. Another one I like to talk a lot about is the microphone. Um, who do you want having access to your phone's microphone? Are there advantages to having the microphone on? Are there advantages to keeping it off? So some applications, it makes a lot of sense to have the microphone on. Um, Shazam is a, is a music service, so they can recognize songs. So in that case, it needs to listen to the song through your microphone in order to tell you what song it is. Um, any social media sites, if you're gonna be posting videos or anything like that, that makes sense to have a microphone on. This is a nanny cam app that I use to keep an eye on my dog during the day. Um, it doesn't have a, does not have a microphone feature. It does not have any output or input. So I don't know why it would wanna have access to my microphone. So that's one that I turned off because I said, this doesn't make sense for me. It doesn't make sense why this 
app that doesn't serve me in any way with, with a microphone would want to access and listen in to what I'm doing. What is uh, Moon? That's another na nanny cam app. Signal? Signal's a, a messaging service, encrypted messaging service. And of course, this is gonna to look totally different for you based on which applications you have installed. So once again, we're gonna go over this again because I think we've covered a lot of information here. When is it safe to give your information? When is it safe to share your location, both physical location and web location across the web? There's good and bad elements to both. You can share your location with family and friends so they can find you, that's a good thing. You can share it with 911 operators so they can find you in case of emergencies. That's a really good thing. Um, it makes it easier to download some applications like Freegal and Hoopla and, and health insurance. Um, so when you're hurt and you need to figure out which hospital takes your health insurance, that's a really good time to use location services. Um, it can map traffic. So when you're leaving the island, you can figure out, should I take the back route? Should I take the regular route? Oh my gosh, traffic is crazy. Should I just have dinner first before I leave? Um, and of course, it's a really good way to track IP and security. So if you're spending all your time in Fort Myers and Sanibel and you suddenly log on in India, your phone's going to go, wait a minute, something's not quite right here. You've never been to India before. I don't think this is you. So it can lock it down and protect your information. So that is a good thing that can happen. But there's also bad. Advertisers can know where you've been and for how long you've been there and create advertisements based on that. There is the potential for becoming a victim of criminal activity, especially when we talk about things like Facebook with the information we're voluntarily sharing. Every time you make a post on the internet, every time you write something, it exists forever. Even if you delete it, it exists forever. There's no deleting anything from the internet. <laughs> and of course your battery and phone performance will decline over time as well. Are you gonna give us some time to let us know or let you know and other people what our experiences were? Sure. And um, um, like uh, when you uh, text your wife or she texts you back and so forth. Yes. So when you have, when, if that's part of it, then I would like to say something about it when it comes time. Yeah, we got like a few more slides here. We're just gonna talk about passwords for a bit and then the floor is yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the ways that we can keep our information safe. You know, we can we can toggle on and off all the different things we want, but at the end of the day, having a good password is really the thing that's going to protect your information the most. And of course, creating a strong password is important, but it's useless unless you write it down. You either have some sort of pass password management or you keep it somewhere secure. Because the easiest way to hack your information is just finding your little book of passwords and copying those down. So how do we create a strong password? There's two different schools of thought on creating different passwords. Um, some people recommend, some security experts will recommend that you use the same base password and then adding to it. So you can use the name of a family pet and then have a code for what that password is for. So I had a horse named Cletus. Um, he was goofy, but he was my, he was my horse. And, <laughs> yeah. and then if I'm going to use a password for my dental insurance, and then I might as well add some numbers in there. So my birth year. So my password would be Cletus and then D-E-N for dental and then 93 for my birth year. So that is the mix of capitals and lowercase, but it's also easy for you to remember. If you're using that same base password, you can go, oh, I wonder what my three digit code would be. You know, if you're gonna do the same thing for Netflix, it could be Cletus NET93. No, of course, absolutely. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint too when we're done. Yeah, there's another thing. Take pictures of everything. I'm just not used to pen and paper. Yeah. I go, wait a minute, take picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you seen this? What is that? The Apple Pencil. This oh, yeah. yeah. You can that. write on here and it'll translate it to text. Huh. Or convert cool. it to text. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> The other school of thought with passwords is to create a one based on your favorite phrase or your favorite quote or your favorite book. So let's say your favorite book, because we're in a library, we have to use a book example, was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, published in 1979. Your password could be extrapolate that based on the letters of your favorite book, and nobody's ever going to guess that because it's nonsensical. It only makes sense to you. 
Or you can use a quote. If your favorite quote was the famous Yogi Berra, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. You could turn that same thing into that password. How do we add an extra layer of security to that? You can change all the I's to ones. That way you're adding in numbers and letters. Makes it a little more difficult to remember, but again, who on earth is gonna guess that password? What about the uh, Safari generated passwords? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question because your phone and your internet services will let you generate certain passwords and without having to write it down, you can just go, oh yeah. And it's, it'll be a great password, it'll be 16 digits, it'll include numbers and letters and dashes and lowercase and everything you need. But what happens when you're suddenly on your phone and you need to access something and you're trying to remember this very complicated 16 digit password that has been auto-generated for you. Well, they save it in keychain. Right, but what happens if you're on a device, like let's say your phone breaks and you need to run into a library and use a computer and sign into something. Yes, all you can remember is gobbledygook. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So there's advantages to something like that. It can keep your stuff secure, but just know there's big disadvantages too. And the last thing we're going to talk about is two-factor authentication, which is where, does anyone know what two-factor authentication is? Yeah, so it's where you have a base password, but to confirm your account, you also have to confirm something by an email or a text message or a phone call to confirm it to you. Um, and it can have really good and really bad elements. Um, it can protect and secure your accounts, your banking information, and your personal information because it's that extra layer of security. But on the other hand, it can also make your life really, really, really difficult. We've had a couple patrons who come in and they go, oh, I got a new phone number and I, my, I can't access my Gmail. Well, do you have access to your old phone number? No, then you can't access your account because once you turn on two-factor authentication, there's no way to opt out. <laughs> and changing your number if you don't have access to it anymore, God help you. You're gonna be on, on the phone with Google trying to access your account for hours and hours and hours. So if you're gonna set up two-factor authentication, make sure you're never planning on changing your phone number, you're never planning on changing your email, and you're always gonna have access to those accounts because otherwise your life will be a nightmare. All right, as we think about what questions you guys may have or stories you might wanna share, um, I'll tell you my next programs. On the 28th, we're gonna learn about Libby and Hoopla, so library services. And then on the second, we're gonna be talking about scammers and common internet scams and how to avoid them. So what questions do you guys have?